Good afternoon, all, and welcome to NASIO State Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Summit. We are excited to have you all here. This is an event for state energy offices, state departments of transportation, state environment agencies, and their PUCs, well with all our federal partners, as well as uh, some companies, charging station providers, and the utilities to talk about what is needed to rapidly and efficiently and equitably build up EV infrastructure. And so I am Cassie Powers. I'm with NASIO, and I'll be making a couple of announcements before we get started. First of all, we have a packed agenda, and so we'll start with a words of welcome and then dive into a discussion with federal agencies hearing from Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, EPA. We'll then hear from some of the charging station providers for some insights um, and their thoughts on barriers to infrastructure build out. Then have a short break and return for a panel on equity considerations. We'll then dive into some conversation with some state DOT, state energy office pairs to talk about how they have been working together on EV infrastructure build out in their states, and then close out with a session on electric system considerations. Uh, we'll then also talk a little bit about our next steps with this larger initiative. And so a few housekeeping announcements before we get started. All participants are on mute. You can feel free to enter questions and comments using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We are also planning to serve out, uh, send out a survey at the end of this event to get a little bit of feedback on our next steps. So encourage everyone to complete that. And if you have any questions, you can contact me or Dylan at NASIO. With that, we'll get started with our first panel and I will turn over to David at NASIO to get us started. David Terry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cassie, and thanks everybody for joining today. I'm David Terry, NASIO's Executive Director. Uh, we're really pleased to kick off the State EV Infrastructure Summit. Uh, we have participants from state agencies across the country, our federal partners, utilities, uh, private sector, local governments, all interested in collaborating on uh, accelerating the rollout of EV infrastructure across different sectors and uh, making our investments as economically efficient and as equitable um, as possible. Uh, the state energy offices and their partners at the state departments of transportation, as well as the environmental agencies, local governments, and of course our federal partners at the Department of Energy um, and the Department of Transportation and EPA, all really working together. That's what this is about, uh, to collaborate uh, on policies, programs, and investments, much as the states have been doing for over a decade, but really accelerating that activity and bringing greater focus, uh, focus to it as we see more investment uh, coming from Congress. Uh, certainly from the federal government uh, in general, uh, various agencies, the private sector and local governments all coming together to take advantage of the economic opportunity that's here, certainly the jobs opportunity, the climate opportunity, and so many other things that electrification of the transportation sector brings. Uh, with that in mind, uh, NASU has been working with our 56 state and territory energy office members across the country and the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, uh, and especially the Sustainable Transportation Office at DOE within EERE, uh, as well as the National Renewable Energy Energy Laboratory. We've been working on developing tools and resources and continuing to do that as we collaborate with different state partners and local partners in the private sector. The summit really kicks off this collaborative effort. We'll be uh, holding several deep dive workshops and sessions throughout the fall uh, to help develop these resources, gain input, learn from one another, uh, and really move forward to take the kind of urgent action and urgent opportunities that there are literally in every region. We have, I think, uh, in the most recent NASIO survey uh, last December, this was the number one topic across the board for all states, all state energy offices. So a really uh, good sign for what we're, to do, what we're ready to do today. Uh, before turning to our speakers, I, I mentioned uh, we have a number of partners and sponsors, uh, certainly EERE and NREL, and we'll hear from Kelly Speaks Bachman uh, shortly, and our state members, but I also wanted to thank uh, the various association members that are reaching out to their uh, colleagues, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, AASHTO, as we know them, the National Association of Clean Air Agencies, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, National Governors Association, the Edison Electric Institute, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, the American Public Power Association, and also ICF, who's providing technical assistance through part of this initiative. Uh, so a, a large list of people, but I think all focused and heading in the right direction. So uh, with that uh, state leadership in mind, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce and turn it over to Doreen Harris, 
President and Chief Executive Officer of the New York State Energy and Research Development Authority, uh, NYSERDA, as we know uh, the agency, uh, one of the national and frankly international leaders in a variety of clean energy uh, and uh, climate activities. So without further ado, I'll turn it to Doreen. Thank you. Thank you um, and good afternoon. Uh, thank you, it's my real pleasure to be with you all today. Again, I'm Doreen Harris, President and CEO of NYSERDA. I am thrilled to join so many state and national colleagues today. And as always, my thanks to NASIO for successfully gathering us together on this important topic. These informative sessions always keep states in the forefront of consideration as our national policies develop and ensure we have full understanding and participation of our energy offices to realize both our state and national goals. It is an exciting time to be having the conversation about ramping up transportation, electrification, and how we can work together to build a more sustainable future for communities across our nation. And with dedicated federal, state, and community leadership and alignment, many of us feel that our shared vision for a clean energy economy for all is within reach, certainly closer than it's ever been. As an example of how we can continue to collaborate and certainly appropriate for today, in April of this year, New York and 11 other states asked the Biden administration to put the US on a path to ensure all vehicles sold in the country are zero emissions. That includes all new passenger cars and light duty trucks um, would be zero emission by 2035 and medium duty and heavy duty vehicles by 2045. We have seen incredible action from the administration to advance new and existing electric vehicle tax credits and invest in much needed charging and fueling infrastructure. In total, this helps to provide the foundation for the rapid changes needed in our auto market, increases consumer confidence, and shows that the cars of the future are already here. Here in New York, we are also doubling down on our state commitment to advance zero emission vehicles with Governor Hochul recently signing legislation that all new passenger cars and trucks, off-road vehicles and equipment sold in New York should be zero emission by 2035 with new medium and heavy duty vehicles following in 2045. But certainly we know as states that we need to continue to work together to successfully move large markets. Over the last decade, New York State and more than a dozen other East Coast states have collaborated with one another and with federal partners to advance electric vehicles through partnerships like the Transportation and Climate Initiative and the ZEV MOU Task Force. And I personally applaud the state of Tennessee for their partnership with the Tennessee Valley Authority to develop an EV charging network every 50 miles along interstates and major highways. This shows the commitment of the federal government, how it can support our state-based energy policy and help create change. Additionally, we know that the USDOT's Alternate Fuel Corridors Program has served as a catalyst to states to develop planning and mapping tools to identify prime locations for fast charging stations. And through NASIO's stellar work with the VW Working Group, the states have started a collaboration with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to establish data collection standards and tracking the usage of trucks and charging stations funded with Volkswagen settlement funds and to compile this data in one place. So these examples provide me with the assurance that together with federal and state colleagues, we can make this important transition in our transportation systems and realize transformative change. And in that light, I am so pleased and honored to be able to open today's discussion with our esteemed colleague, Kelly Speaks Bachman. Kelly is the Acting Assistant Secretary and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, EERE, at the US Department of Energy. And in her role, she leads and directs EERE focused on creating and sustaining American leadership in the transition to a global clean energy economy. She oversees the planning and execution of the organization's $2.8 billion portfolio of research, development, demonstration, and deployment activities in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainable transportation. And most recently, Kelly served as the first CEO of the Energy Storage Association the National Trade Organization for the Energy Storage Industry. 
She has spent more than 20 years working in energy and environmental issues in the public, NGO, and private sectors. And in 2019 was honored by the Kleene Awards as Woman of the Year. So I can think a few other people than Kelly who are able to take on this essential role leading EERE. Through our conversations to date, I know that the Biden administration has selected a true leader to jumpstart the transition to a national and global clean energy economy. And I am confident that together we can transform the electric vehicle market in the United States as well. So with that, I will welcome Kelly uh, to the stage. Doreen, thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here uh, with you and with David and with all the real leaders on the ground uh, in, in making sure that we have this equitable transition for America to net zero greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide, not later than 2050. Um, I'm just so excited to talk to you today, especially uh, about uh, the sustainable transportation work that, that we do in EERE. But um, first, I wanna just talk a little bit about how we directly support uh, President Biden's clean energy plan, which really lays out that framework to address a climate, the climate crisis. And, put America on an irreversible path to achieving the carbon-free electric sector by 2035 and an emissions-free economy, not later than 2050. Um, you know, states are just really where the rubber meets the road in terms of expanding this goal and making sure that the potential of clean energy technologies will benefit the communities and individuals uh, that live in each of the states and each of the, uh, across the country in each of these communities. And that's especially true as we tackle the challenge of ensuring that the incredible next generation electric vehicles that are being developed today have sufficient infrastructure in place to allow Americans to drive electric vehicles without the concerns of running out of power. The feedback and insights that you all um, are gonna be sharing today will be invaluable in helping us at EERE to support your work, to support the states, particularly in expanding EV charging infrastructure nationwide. So I'd like to help set the stage by uh, sharing our immediate priorities. And then later, I'm really excited that you all will have a chance to hear from our Deputy Assistant Secretary for Sustainable Transportation, Michael Barabee, who's going to talk some about some of the very specific work that we're doing to help expand that EV charging infrastructure. So as to our overall priorities, uh, we are taking really a cross-cutting approach to clean energy implementation at ERE because we know that we've got no time to waste like thinking about what one technology might do and then going back to the next, uh, going over to the next technology and then later figuring out how it all fits together. This has to be a cross-cutting approach um, so that we can fight climate change now. Every new ton of CO2 emitted matters. We know that there's no single technology and no single solution that's gonna get us there. It's gonna take a coordinated effort in a variety of areas. So we have focused our efforts on five overarching priorities that are essential in accelerating this transition. That's decarbonizing electricity, the industrial sector, especially the energy intense industries, uh, reducing the carbon footprint of buildings, decarboning the, decarbonizing the agricultural sector, and of course, decarbonizing transportation which still accounts for the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions in the US, about 34% as of 2019. And so while each of these sectors are major contributors to our nation's greenhouse gas profile, today we're focusing on electrifying transportation, one of the single most effective ways that we can combat the climate crisis while still strengthening American innovation in a vitally important global market. The changing dynamic of the grid is also, it's just really increasingly apparent from the growing number of advanced energy technologies that we see uh, emerging today. And that is especially includes EVs with their enormous ability to impact electricity demand and electricity supply, also grid reliability and resilience. Uh, we recognize the need to evaluate the impact of increased EV penetration and integration to the grid, as well as the need for continued research on uh, standards, including communication systems, protocols, and charging stations. But uh, to accelerate this use of EVs, we really need to make huge strides in also in increasing the infrastructure. So last month, President announced an executive order setting another bold target, electric vehicles making up 50% of all new passenger vehicles sold in 2030. 
So in the next decade, and as he said, there's a vision of the future that is now beginning to happen. It is electric and there is no going back. Uh, the president also set a goal to deploy 500,000 new public charging points by 2030 built for the convenience and the cost and the comfort of consumers. We know that so many Americans would love the opportunity to go electric, but we want to make that easier and cheaper for them to do just that. So uh, we also know in setting these targets, uh, we need to work closely uh, and collaborate with our state and local partners, making sure that we're building out the infrastructure in the best way to fit each community and everyone in those communities, uh, not just those with uh, financial uh, advantage, but in disadvantaged communities as well. Um, so DOE's network of more than 75 clean city coalitions are leveraging DOE tools and training and providing hands-on technical assistance to a variety of communities, including tribal and local governments to build out their transportation infrastructure. The coalition uh, coordinates with industry partners and fleets to solve problems and identify the technology barriers to accelerating the deployment of EVs and charging infrastructure. And at the national level, uh, DOE offers online tools like the Alternative Fuels Data Center Station Locator, easy to say, uh, but that's for drivers and uh, competitive funding opportunities uh, we offer out that will encourage innovation in areas like uh, EV uh, supply equipment planning. So in the months ahead, we will continue to launch uh, EV community partner demonstration programs uh, that provide templates for larger scale EV and charger deployments. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we know that the bottom line is in order to really get the EVs on the road, we need to make EVs more affordable. And to do that, we're going to do three key things. One is reduce the cost of EV batteries. Two is reduce the use of critical materials. And three is to recycle the batteries. We have a set goal of $80 per kilowatt hour manufactured cost for a battery pack by 2030. Uh, and that's for about a 300 mile range electric vehicle. Um, and that's basically a reduction of 44% from the current cost of $143 a kilowatt hour. Uh, achieving this cost target is gonna lead to cost parity between EVs and traditional combustion engine cars, which is really what we're going for. We want people to be able to choose it without having to make sacrifice. Uh, so our DOE, our DOE goal wide, uh, our goal DOE wide is for EVs to reach that cost parity with gas cars by 2028 maybe even sooner if um, we consider some of the high mileage trucks. So these are pretty ambitious targets, but I think we can get there based on what we've seen across the clean energy technologies in recent years, how we're looking at the supply chain to integrate uh, the, the decrease in the cost of technologies. Um, I mean, if we just think about the technologies like solar and wind and the cost structures that have fallen in, in recent years with really a, a very concerted focus, I think we can get there. Um, we just recently released the Solar Futures study, uh, which really showed the cost of solar panels have fallen so much that eventually, and they will continue to fall, eventually we could produce about 40% of our electricity needs by 2035, just from solar alone. And that's, meanwhile, the, the wind market report is finding that, you know, more wind energy was installed in 2020 than any, any other energy source, making up about 42% of all the new U.S. capacity and supporting 117,000 jobs across America. So now we just need to maintain this momentum across all the sectors that we um, are focused on um, to be able to grow this clean energy economy to the benefit of all Americans. Um, just a little, uh, not not just a little bit, but I, I would like to speak a little bit to the uh, state and local collaboration that we know is so important. We, we know we can't accomplish any of these targets without working really closely and learning from state and local governments. How do we do best? How do we do this effectively? And how do we do this quickly? Uh, we know that our first step is to listen. Um, as a former state official in Maryland, I'm really keenly aware to some of the solutions of even the most pressing problems are found in our communities. And I'm really eager to hear about the state and local solutions and how our team at DOE can collaborate with you and expand upon that and scale these best practices to make sure that we're achieving equitable decarbonization. Um, I, we know that, enduring, that an enduring challenge in government is to rally everyone together 
and to coordinate efforts to maximize impact. And that's what programs like our Clean Energy Cities Coalitions are all about. And that's what I'm here. And I will come back to NASIO and as often as I can to make sure that we are collaborating. Uh, we're racing against time here. Um, you might have seen the most recent uh, report from the United Nations that called this moment a code red for humanity. And given these stakes, global progress in the transportation sector is really more urgent than ever. So your work is playing an invaluable role in tackling these barriers to wider deployment of American innovation uh, across the globe. Um, so before I close, I would like to, to keep in mind that even as we're focusing on the technology and the policy challenges before, before us, we really are here to serve people and to serve our communities. And so it's in that vein, in that spirit, that it's really just crucial that we build support and constituencies for breakthroughs in clean energy technologies by really demonstrating how our research and programs can benefit everyone. Uh, we have an obligation to ensure that the economy benefits everyone, especially consumers and workers and communities that are impacted by energy transition uh, that's already underway. It's a key priority for this administration and for DOE to address environmental injustices that dis disproportionately affect communities of color, low-income communities, and indigenous communities. In fact, uh, we launched an Office of Energy Justice to oversee our efforts in this area. We're working to ensure that 40% of the overall benefits of relevant federal investments are delivered to disadvantaged communities. And we're working on strong, consistent metrics across the whole of government to make sure that we're meeting our targets. So I'm looking forward not only to the technology and the policy discussions, but to hearing about uh, what's discussed on uh, equity today and exploring how we can make sure to serve the communities that need the most help and for whom we are here to serve. Uh, we're going to be continuing to work with all of you across the states and territories to accelerate the progress that's really critical to securing this clean energy future. And I really look forward to it. And I appreciate this time that you've allotted me uh, to address you today. Thanks. Thanks very much to Kelly and to David and Doreen for your opening comments. We appreciate you being here. With that, we will transition to our next panel. And so I'd like to invite, uh, I'd like to invite Will as well as Michael and Andrew and Ale to uh, come on camera and we will get started. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Will Tour with the Colorado Office of Energy to get us started. Will? Great, thank you very much, Cassie. Yes, I'm Will Tour, the director of the Colorado Energy Office, and very excited for this uh, discussion this morning. You know, Colorado is one of many states across the, the country where transportation is our largest single source of greenhouse gas pollution and one of our largest sources of localized air pollution. And we know that we need to move towards an electric vehicle future in order to address that pollution. As a state, we've set uh, targets of moving to a fully 100% zero emission vehicle on-road fleet for both light and medium and heavy duty vehicles by 2050 in order to achieve our goals. And our legislature recently passed a new fee legislation to invest nearly a billion dollars in transportation electrification this decade. But we know that we can't achieve our goals without a strong state and federal partnership. Um, we've been very excited to see the um, inclusion of significant investments for electric vehicles in the bipartisan infrastructure package. By my count, I think there are probably 13 different locations in the, in the package where there are uh, important investments to support transportation electrification. Uh, you know, a few that I would, would highlight for our uh, discussion today are the two and a half billion dollars uh, through the US DOT that would be grants for charging and fueling infrastructure um, with half of that focusing on corridor charging and half of it uh, focusing on community charging. The $5 billion of formula grants through the US DOT that would go to state DOTs to primarily focus on corridors but with an ab ability for uh, funding to go to community charging, the significant investments in zero emission school buses, including the two and a half billion dollars for 
um, ZEV buses and another two and a half billion dollars for alternative fuel vehicle buses. The funding for uh, buses and bus facilities with a portion of that going to low and zero emission vehicles, um, as well as significant investments to uh, support reducing emissions at port facilities. So a lot that's packed in there and that really does, does engage multiple agencies across the federal government. I'm really excited to see EPA and DOT and Department of Energy working together on this and really looking forward to the conversation on how you're working together and how we can collaborate with you as states. So three, I'm gonna um, introduce our three panelists. Uh, the first one is Andrew Wishnia, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate Policy at US DOT. And then Alejandra Nunez, who is a Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Office of Air and Radiation at EPA. And then Michael Barube, the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Transportation at US DOE. So Andrew, let's start with you. Thank you, Will. And we've been informed that Andrew is running a couple of minutes late. Okay, in that case. Yes. Ale, why don't we start with you? Yes, let me let me do that. Thank you, Will, and thank you all for uh, inviting me to speak uh, with you today. It's really an honor to be here with my colleagues uh, from the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation to, to talk about the administration's priorities for electric vehicles and charging infrastructure and how my office at EPA, the Office of Air and Radiation and the Office of Transportation and Air Quality is supporting these efforts. Let me introduce a little bit uh, this discussion, reinstating the priorities of the Biden administration. As you know, the president made clear from he, the first days in office back in January that climate change is a major priority for us. On January 27, the president issued an executive order that calls for a whole of government approach to address climate change and put the US on a path to achieve net zero emissions economy wide by no later than 2050. This whole of government approach starts with us, the agencies in the federal family being role models. Uh, President Biden directed all agencies, for example, to convert federal fleets to clean and zero emission vehicles. Federal officials from around the government have convened to develop and implement a plan that gets us to a zero emitting fleet as soon as possible. Just a few weeks ago, on August 5th, President Biden issued another executive order setting a goal that half of all new passenger cars and light trucks sold in 2030 be zero emission vehicles, as has already been mentioned. Let me talk about EPA's role in, in under this executive order and our regulatory work. So we have been tasked by the president to establish multi-pollutant emission standards for cars and light trucks and for the heavy duty trucking fleet. Consistent with this uh, executive order announcement, EPA also proposed federal greenhouse gas emission standards for passenger cars and light trucks for model years 2023 through 2026. We have an active com uh, a period, a common period open right now. This proposal would revise standards set by the previous administration and would get the EPA's clean cars program back on track using technology available to make vehicles cleaner and to encourage more hybrid and electric vehicle technology. The August executive order on clean cars and trucks also directs us to initiate another rulemaking to set standards for model years 2027 and beyond to speed the transition of the light duty vehicle fleet toward a zero emissions future. Separately, we also announced plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other harmful air pollutants from heavy duty trucks through a series of major rulemakings that will take place over the next three years. Taken together, both the light and heavy duty rules would help set the course on the US on a course to achieve significant pollution reductions in transportation and the way for deploying zero emission technologies and substantial improve, improvements in air quality that they will make possible. I also wanna highlight really briefly that for each of these uh, actions, EPA is committed to deep engagement with a wide range of stakeholders, including environmental justice communities. We already started this outreach and have seen significant interest in engagement from EJ stakeholders, in particular for progress on reducing emissions uh, from the heavy duty sector. 
it will be important to demonstrate to all that EVs can work in communities across the country beyond those places with convenient home charging or other infrastructure advantages. But regulation is just one aspect of EPA's ongoing efforts to support clean vehicles and to advance electrification. EPA has funded a wide spectrum of on-highway and on-road zero emission technologies through the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act or DERA program since this program started back in 20, uh, 2008. DERA has funded the electrification of airport ground support equipment, electric port terminal tractors, over 50 electric transit and school buses, and recently an electric ferry. DERA grants can also be used to fund EV chargers purchased in conjunction with eligible electric vehicles or equipment. The bipartisan infrastructure bill currently under consideration would provide another 5 billion for electric or clean school bus replacements over five years. If enacted into law, this funding program would also support the government's Justice 40 initiative because low income areas, rural areas, tribal schools and um, high need local education agencies would receive funding priority. Also, through our Ports Initiative Program, we work well with our federal partners to identify opportunities to coordinate and support emissions reductions projects as part of major federal infrastructure investments and other programs involving ports. Our Ports Initiative is really working to accelerate adoption of cleaner technologies at ports, including zero emission technologies for equipment replacement. There's certainly an opportunity and interest in funding zero emission vehicle technologies in various core related sectors, including cargo handling equipment. While EV investment is important, it will require more than just putting EVs on the road and installing stations for us to be successful. We also need to build on the early enthusiasm for EVs we see in the market and help even greater numbers of consumers see these vehicles as meeting their needs. EPA does this in several ways. First, we provide information to consumers. EPA's Green Vehicle Guide website is a great guide to learn about how your transportation choices, what you drive, how you drive, and what fuel you use can impact both the environment and your pocket. You can also find easy to understand content on EVs, including a video on how they work, along with a web page on common EV myths at epa.gov green vehicles. And those interested in buying a home charger can find energy efficient Energy Star certified electric car chargers to add to the environmental benefits and cost savings of owning an EV at energystar.com. We also have resources specifically aimed at states, local governments, and tribes. This spring, we hosted a webinar focused on EVs and equity, where speakers share their approach for engaging with traditionally underserved and diverse communities and on how to provide equitable access to EVs. We've done other webinars on, on other related topics, such as working with utilities and introduction to EV-ready buildings, campaigns driving EV awareness. We would be very interested in hearing from you about what additional resources would be most useful to states and localities and how we can continue to work together to meet our electrification goals. Thank you very much. Michael? Join my mute here. Hello, Will and uh, Ali. Great to see you both. Uh, you know, to answer your, your question, Will, like how are we going to coordinate and work together? Um, I would say we are going to, we are already coordinating work together intensely, closely, uh, and uh, very, very actively. So I, I think one of the things, you know, I know we have, of course, many, many people from the state, state energy offices and other related organizations on. I, I certainly hope you are seeing and will continue to see a all of government approach. And I will tell you that that's not just um, words. This is a uh, very, I think, intense personal um, connection and commitment that Ale and her team, Carl Simon, who's on supporting us as well, Andrew and, and the team at DOT, my group, um, we are committed to. Uh, we are all very much committed to achieving an entire transportation decarbonization future. And we know to do that, we're going to all have to work very closely together. This is a huge challenge, right? We are we are affecting 
it's something affects everyone's lives personally. Every person uses transportation every single day. When they use it, they're not focused on the greenhouse gas emissions, right? They're focused on the cost. They're focused on the convenience of getting them to where they need to be. Um, so we can't mess that up, but we need to move to a, a system that does allow us to get to a uh, cleaner future, whether it be from greenhouse gas or local emissions. Um, I think one of the, the questions you asked was like, how, so how will let's say DOE work with EPA and DOT Andrew and joins us will share a little bit more, I think, about the EV charging program that you mentioned, which I know is on a lot of people's minds. Um, DOE, as many of you know, and have for now many years have had a lot of work on deploying EVs and EV chargers, um, as well as developing the technology a lot through our Clean Cities programs. As we go forward, right, the scope we're talking about, though, is multiple orders of magnitude higher now, right? Going from maybe we do 50, 60, 80 million dollars a year to doing billions. So the vision that we have, and this is um, something that was well thought out and talked about across the agencies, was you know, EPA and DOT have the capability for programs, like I talked about school buses and DOT on the EV charging, to do the actual kind of fuel deployment of dollars. DOE's job is kind of to be this um, foundational piece, working and very closely supporting both the agencies with technical assistance, with kind of, if you will, let's say the deep bench we have with all the national labs and all the pro uh, programs we've done in the past, like on the ground, working with local communities on deploying uh, new vehicle technology, you know, a lot of electric, but you know, five, six years ago, a lot of it was natural gas and other things, but we know how to work at a fleet level, at a city level, at a community level to help address the challenges, literally have tiger teams that are on call that can help with that implementation. So th there's still a lot to be written, as they say, about how we actually deploy this. But our, our view is that it will be very, very much a tight partnership across the agencies and then with the states and the communities that are getting those EV charging dollars to deploy. So it won't be just throw the money over and here you go, I mean, go to it. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to be in the way, right? So it's going to take partnership. It's going to take working closely together. Um, we will do... You know, once the bills pass, because we can't only do so much until then, you will see us moving up very quickly with listening sessions and, and stakeholder engagement to make sure that we're all connected and uh, moving out, you know, let's say with, with one voice and uh, one approach with the state and local communities. Just like Kelly said, we know that the power is there at the state and local level to make these things happen. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think we'll jump to questions and then when Andrew is able to join us, we'll jump back to Andrew making opening remarks. So I guess first question for you, Ale, is around the medium and heavy duty vehicle segment and the, the rulemakings that you'll be moving forward on from the perspective of, of one state, and I suspect there are other states that are, have sort of similar deliberations going on right now. You know, we're in the process of considering whether we would want to it adopt the advanced clean truck regulations that the California Air Resources Board has promulgated. But as we think about that, we don't really know where things are headed at the federal level. And it would be very helpful to you know, have a greater understanding of what type of regulations might we see at the federal level and what sort of emissions reductions might we expect from that in the MHD sector. Yes, absolutely, Will. So, so... Fortunately, uh, the executive order that, that the president uh, signed in, back in early August of clean cars and trucks offers very clear direction for EPA on what we have to do. When that uh, when the order was announced, EPA also put uh, put together and published a more detailed document that's called the Clean Trucks Plan that you can all find in in our website. That sets this timeline. So, so I mentioned earlier that we have a current, like an active proposal for the short term, but this executive order directs us to actually issue light duty vehicle standards, both for passenger cars and light trucks, but also to look at the medium duty um, vehicles in uh, model years 2027 and, and beyond, at least through 2030. So that's one, uh, hopefully that answers the question on, on medium duty, but then for the heavy duty sector, we will be engaging in, in two uh, major rulemakings. One of them we're hard at work on right now, which will um, 
apply to heavy duty vehicles starting in model year 2027, and it will set tougher standards for criteria pollutants for the entire heavy duty sector. And we are also looking under the executive order at targeted upgrades to the current phase two greenhouse gas emission standard for certain um, heavy duty applications that are uh, being electrified pretty rapidly. So that's the first rule that we uh, intend to finalize in 2022 in order to be able to cover model year 2027, given lead time requirements that we have under the Clean Air Act. That's the first rule. And then the second one would set more stringent greenhouse gas emission standards for new heavy duty vehicles, the entire, the rest of the sector sold as soon as model year 2030 and beyond. So we don't know how it will be called, but essentially it's the next we have the current uh, phase two greenhouse gas standard. That's going to be the next version. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, a, a question for you. So as we move towards widespread adoption of electric vehicles and especially widespread adoption of you know, medium heavy duty vehicles, we're likely looking at some pretty significant electric demand you know, both at the distribution level and at the, at the larger level. How is DOE thinking about kind of that intersection between transportation electrification and the needs of the grid? Yeah, no, excellent question. We, um, as Kelly said, we are taking an entire economy-wide look right, at decarbonization. And I work really closely with our team at DOE that has the task to help achieve the 100% clean grid goal by 2035. We've done a lot of look um, modeling at the transmission level down to the distribution level. And we really believe that if we move out simultaneously on the transportation electrification and moving to a highly renewables grid, we can do the two uh, together to be synergistic. And a key part of that is that transportation will pose a significant new load, but it also poses a really manageable load. So one of the things that we want to see, and I encourage all the people in the states to do is, as you start thinking about deployments, we have to have smart charge management technology so that you can flatten out that load. And that will actually decrease the cost of the electricity. So that you know, helps enable it, as well as it will help overall with the grid level and then you know, minimize the amount of incremental generation we have to do. Uh, we've done a number of studies to kind of answer the question, can we handle this? Can, we, can there be, will there be enough electricity? And the answer is yes. I mean, I think every expert I talk to says, we will be able to have the generation we need. Um, we will be able to have the transmission we need. We do have to think about building out a lot more transmission capability to get to the high level of renewables. So I think from a state level, we at DOE want to be partnering with the states and DOT at looking at right of ways for that transmission as one example. Um, and then looking, um, I think we're going to also do work with utilities to kind of put together the distribution level, kind of mo a model that, for example, a state or community could do to say, okay, if I have big bus depots or school districts or big loads, uh, maybe a, um, a medium heavy duty truck depot, how do I model what that load will be now and growing over the next 10 years? Um, and then how do I plan for it, work with utilities? One, one thing I will bring up just today, um, NACFI, the North, North American uh, Coalition on Fuel Efficiency, I got that quite, not quite right, but basically uh, the trucking group that's been working on things like, uh, they run a big program called Run on Less every year, and they um, just ended their Run on Less Electric. They had, I think, 15 fleets, real world, electrified trucks, class six to class seven, and using them in everyday usage. And one of the big things that came out of it is most of these trucks didn't need a lot of high power charging. They're doing a hundred miles at most a day, maybe even 50 miles a day, they can pot and then they're coming back to base, they can charge all night. And so I think we got to keep in mind too, that it's not all going to be just super, super high power charging. There's going to be, you know, a lot of mid-level charging, including in that truck space. A related question, any infrastructure package or it's funding for the DOE or the Smart Grid Investment Grants Program? Have you sort of thought about how that could be coordinated with the DOT EV charging grants? in order to address some of these issues? Yeah, we um, we have thought about it. I, I will not, I'll be honest, we don't have kind of mechanisms in place, but there's a few things. There's some things in the reconciliation bill that's also still under discussion that would work very synergistically as well on the charging side with community grant programs. Um, 
I, you know, going back to what I said up at the beginning, we are going to have a, a level of coordination people have never seen across these agencies. Uh, and when it comes to like EV charging, it should feel more like one joint piece. And in fact, I'll point out people may not have seen, but in the infrastructure bill, there is a new joint office of DOE and DOT of energy environment, specifically to have a really funded joint office that is in charge of kind of helping to make sure we're collaborating on all these cross pieces. Um, and not to leave uh, Ale and, and EPA out, they will be there closely, closely with us as well. Sometimes we keep a little bit of a between the regulatory, let's see, rulemaking side and, and some of the other pieces, we want to keep the appropriate distance as needed, but uh, we will be partnering closely. Great. Yeah, no, that's very exciting to hear. You know, there's a number of questions. These may be ones that would be easier for um, DOT to answer, but I know they're of great interest to states, so I'm going to throw them out there. One is around Buy America requirements and sort of the, the potential challenges around finding Buy America compliant chargers. And we know what sort of guidance is going to be offered to, to states in order to help uh, us you know, effectively deploy these funds. I don't know, Ali, if you have any thoughts. I, uh... Let me let me just say, uh, Will and uh, Michael, just generally. So th the funding bills currently being debated in Congress do provide some guidance to EPA in terms of our program obligations, but it's a bit early for us to say how the agency will approach these new requirements if if the um, if if these uh, bills are enacted. But I I, I just want to know that we will be as clear as possible for all stakeholders on how we will implement those programs and, and those requirements if the actions are adopted. I, I feel it's a little bit early, but those are th things that, that we're thinking through and we'll be sharing information. Yeah, no, I, I, I will say kind of at a very broad, broad level, um, one of the things you know that Kelly talked about is the importance of, of jobs. And as we move to electrification, one of the key things that we know is that there will be changes uh, in that energy economy, but there's growth opportunity on the battery cell and all the battery supply chain. And uh, the administration put out a very significant report, 100 day study based on an executive order on the supply chain need for batteries. The Buy America ties into this very importantly, right? We, we believe we need to move to having cells manufactured in the U.S. and drive that supply chain also for national security reasons, quite honestly, back to the U.S. So we know we don't quite have the capacity now on the cells in the U.S. And I saw a question on the chargers as well. Um, but the administration is going to be working aggressively to try to build up that domestic capacity which goes hand in hand with Buy America. So we'll see how the legislation comes out at the end, but I would just suggest to everyone to be thinking that's where we need to go because we need to drive that domestic industry here. So it's, a, it's an important piece. Great, thank you. Um, could you each speak a little bit to how you are addressing equity as you think about you know, deploying these new programs? I mean, I, I can get started, Michael, if you'd like. I, we are very, we are being very intentional about engagement with environmental justice organizations in the regulations we are currently developing. Um, one example is actually the current uh, effort that we're working on to set uh, NOx and um, standards on heavy duty trucks. So we, we've had a lot of engagement with folks in the communities, the organizations that, that do a lot of work in this space for many years in ports and, and the like in our partnership programs like the Ports Initiative are very much uh, designed as to provide technical assistance which I can speak more uh, to if you'd like, but also to really emphasize the, engage, the engagement piece, for example, with for owners so that they get to know the, the communities that, that live in those areas. And our DARA program is really targeted to replacing um, dirty diesel engines with cleaner vehicles and engines. And, and we are looking even more intentionally at how to target those, those grants better to, to frontline communities that have historically been overburdened uh, with air, air pollution, especially in light of our um, 
duties under Justice 40 and, and the executive were there on environmental justice. Yeah, I, I um, double everything uh, like I said there and um, Kelly spoke to some of this. This is a, a big priority, of course, at DOE as well. Um, one of the things we are doing, we, as many of you know, we have Clean Cities coalitions that are a great, great set of coalitions across the country. We really want to try to leverage those coalitions to be reaching out more broadly to those communities that have historically been overburdened on pollution and underserved on transportation. Um, one thing I think that, that I think about all the time is I think we have to remember that you know, transportation now is the second highest expense for a typical American household. Uh, it's very high if you're in the lower half of the economic uh, uh, strata. And we have to first and foremost be thinking about providing good, cost-effective, and just efficient mobility options for people, right? That's their first need. And um, you know, no one's gonna no one's gonna be trading in the electric vehicle for the gas vehicle if it doesn't get them where they need to be, where they need to be there. So I think providing those mobility options, which includes thinking about transit and micro mobility, um, innovative approaches. So we we imagine we're gonna continue a big focus on that because that's like mission one. And if we do that well, I think that gives us permission to then say, look, we really need to change things up as well and move to a high level of uh, low greenhouse gas and, and low emission technology as well. Great. Um, a couple of questions around sort of the, the infrastructure deployment. So you know, one, I think sort of interesting issue is this question of sort of investment in corridor charging versus investment in community charging. And you know, I think the needs are going to vary significantly across the states, partially dependent on how much investment has already been made you know, in, in the example of Colorado, when we project our needs for investment into the future, they're larger in the community charging space than in the corridor charging space. Do you have a sense as to how the administration will be looking at that balance and how they'll be determining when a corridor charging needs have been met so that funding can go to community yeah. charging? No, that's a good question. Um, you know, we'll have to wait to see how the final bill comes out, of course. But, um, you know, reading how it is now, the, the president has set a really clear goal, right, to lay out a national network. And many of us have been in this space a while know that there is that hesitancy because of the fear of the long trips. We know it's a small number of trips. We know in the grand scheme of the number of chargers, it's, it's smaller than what you need in the community space. But mission number one of this program is to make sure we nail a good national corridor. So states have pieces, we're gonna be looking then with the states to say, how do we fill all of those in? How do we make sure that we have the national network covered? So that's like mission number one, uh, which is why I think you see it worded that way. But we're gonna use science-based models, right? And we have a lot of good models at DV to look at where the charging is needed, what type. There is a lot in the community that will be needed. A lot of those corridors go through communities. So we think there's a lot of chargers that can serve both the corridor need person doing the 200, 300 mile trip, but also serve the need of people who are using it for opportunity charging in there. Um, we will remain very strongly focused though on the 25% of people that we know that don't really have any capability of having home charging. Um, we are gonna come out with a new study in a few days from NREL that really for the first time looks scientifically at the numbers, exactly how many people have charging that they could put in where they park, that they could modify their parking to get to it, or really they, they don't have that option. And we've got a lot of good data on that. Um, so we're gonna need multi-unit dwelling and basically just people that don't have charging where they park currently. And that will be a combination of some level two and some DC fast charging. Um, you know, I think we have to be uh, recognized. None of us know the absolute ultimate answer. And the good news is this program will roll out a little bit over time. Um, we don't have to get all the chargers in in the next, you know, one year, but we got to get it going pretty quickly. So um, we'll be working closely with states and try to be really flexible on that point, though. Great. Mm -hmm. um, could you both speak a little bit to the, the timing? You, you described, as, assuming that the infrastructure bill is approved by Congress moving quickly, any, any sense of how quickly after the, the passage of the bill, uh, funding might start to be available to the states? 
um, I would always point to the bill and there's a 90 day, um, <laughs> there's a 90 day requirement in there. I can't, I don't remember the exact details of how it's worded. Um, what, you know, but the point is it's 90 days to get pieces moving. This will fall under federal highways. Um, uh, every time I talk, I mean, we meet multiple times a week with the team collectively to talk through these things. So uh, things will start moving fast, I think, um, because that's what, if, if the bill passes as it is now. So uh, we're doing what we can to be ready. Um, so, and, and we, look, I think we all recognize between the charging and all the other pieces in here, I mean, this is, this is the big push we need to achieve the climate goals that have been set out. Um, it's going to be a bit of a scramble at first. I think all of us collectively will just have to do a few, like, remember we're all everyone's doing their best, uh, trust in each other, trust that people are trying to get to do the right thing. I think as we get the first few months in the next few and the next few, things will smooth out a little bit. Um, but uh, I think the states, local communities and federal, if we can all be working together, um, we can pull this off and we can make this happen. Yes, and I, I will add to what Michael just said that for um, for EPA, for the program that I mentioned, a proposal to create a brand new program for a zero emission vehicle and cleaner school buses. Um, we're obviously, you, you know, like awaiting uh, what happens with the bill, but, but thinking through how to build upon our experience under the DARE program. To, and, and take advantage of all the knowledge and, and relationships with stakeholders that, that we already have to share information. But I do recall that the text of the bill, basically their XCPA to start spending the funds uh, next year. So, so we basically would have a few months to set up a new program. Things, uh, things would be happening very fast. That is for sure. I, I agree with Michael. Great. Exciting to hear that they'll be moving quickly there, and I'm sure that'll be very challenging. Um, I'd like to ask both of your advice to for the states on a couple of areas. So, what you know, one interesting dynamic here at the state level is that in many states, historically, it's been the state energy offices that have been focused largely on transportation electrification. In some in some cases, there's great collaboration among you know, the air agency and the DOT and the energy office, in other cases, it may be somewhat what new for them. Any, any advice, you know, given um, the federal collaboration, many of the funds flowing through state, state DOTs, sort of on how state agencies can, can best work together in order to advance transportation electrification? I would, um, my advice would be one, go back to look at the, you know, what, what happened with your VW funds? How did it work? And kind of, um, then I, I would suggest to me, the winning program is every state has the state energy office who you're right, where we see that that's where a lot of the historical expertise is here, but the DOT has the right of way. I think we're, we're talking about much bigger scale than in the past. So taking a cue off of like, you know, some people say, well, why isn't DOE just implementing it? You've done a lot of EV chargers. Well, when we look at the scale of what we're doing here, we really felt we need the power of USDOT and the ability to work across all the states. I got to think many states has the same. At the federal level, we're going to look to the states and say, you know your state, you know how it works best. But I would be comforted if I see a state uh, energy office and transportation office that has a joint team that's working seamlessly to execute the program bringing in also um, and having some linkages to their utilities and their uh, utility commission, because that will be a big piece as well in here. When I see you know, those three groups, the state utility commissions, the DOT and DOE partnered together, it seems like just things go faster and work really well. Yes, I very much second what Michael just said. And, and I will say, and you mentioned this, Will, that you know at the federal level, we'll be working on national emission standards for both light duty and heavy duty vehicles, but the states, many states are very interested in following the leadership of California and adopting the uh, California standards, in particular, the, this uh, ZEP mandate type of rules. Um, you, you mentioned the advanced clean trucks rule on, under section 177. So, so coordination also with the DEPs at the state level is gonna be uh, crucial because those are important regulatory incentives for expansion of, of electric vehicles. 
state. In the state. And one more piece of advice to, to seek from both of you. How can states sort of most effectively engage with the federal agencies to provide sort of input on program design and share what sort of technical support needs that we may have in order to implement these programs? You know, one suggestion, I, so um, there is actually an EV working group that is uh, statutorily required in the bill. That'll be one way, uh, of course, you can't get every voice in there. Um, I would strongly suggest utilizing NASIO, quite honestly, if I can put uh, Cassie and David here. Uh, we have been trying to partner closely with them. Um, that's a really effective way to kind of consolidate a bunch of voices and get them over, over to us. Um, but I will also say, look, if, if a state has a kind of strong point of view or something they want to get in uh, between uh, Andrew, uh, Ali, myself, you know, you, get, you know, we, we can make sure we're, we're the ones kind of at the table, if you will, working with the other team. Uh, but NASIO would be a great place as a, a group to bring some of those points of view together and ASHTO um, as well. So, again, it comes back to, you know, if we could have ASHTO and NASIO as like organizations representing the states, kind of consolidating some of that input, uh, that would be great. But you know, we're also well, willing to take it directly. Could you say a little bit more about the EV working group? There's a statutory requirement to create a new EV working group. It's, uh, I assume, will be set up under FACA rules. Um, DOT and DOE secretaries have to convene a group. It has a very set number of or one representative from da, 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 all these groups. But it's a way to get input. Uh, and the law gives them like three tasks they must accomplish in the next two years to basically provide, kind of answer some of these big picture questions. What's the right implementation plan? How are we doing? What things have to be taken into account? Um, it will be happening in parallel to us be implementing some of the big provisions. So we view it as a way to kind of get maybe some uh, some feedback as we're implementing. Uh, but it's, you know, uh, no one need at, uh, send a letter asking to be on it. I think it'll be a public process by which we get to seek uh, recommendations for membership and things like that when the time comes. Well, I know that we're running out of... Uh, and we Oh, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say that Andrew was having some technical issues, but he has dialed in. So um, if you would like, we can stay on for another few minutes and get an overview from the DOT's perspective. Andrew? <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Yeah, I am, guys, I am so sorry um, for the technical issue. It's not just me, which is part good news, but part bad news. It's, it's the entire Department of Transportation and our VPN server. But um, my apologies for um, for not being here, but I, I heard Michael and uh, Michael knows the stuff um, inside and out. And as my, Michael probably mentioned, the Department of Energy and Department of Transportation are just radically aligned on um, of the need to deploy transportation electrification and do so in a way that's convenient, accessible um, uh, as, as possible. Um, and so the good news is you know, after years of work, we have an opportunity, you know, through the president's leadership of, um, of deploying up to seven and a half billion dollars for highway charging. Um, and, and that's sort of, um, you know, what's taken a lot of the headlines and, and for good reason. Um, but we also have multimodal capacity, you know, throughout all of the various um, uh, transportation modes to deliver transportation electrification to ports. So we have $2.25 billion through our port infrastructure development program. Um, we have funding through FAA for, for zero emission vehicle infrastructure. Um, we have uh, an additional uh, surplus of funds for, um, for FTA through their low no program. Um, uh, you know, so whether it's transit, whether it's ports, whether it's highway charging, um, airports, um, we're really looking at a comprehensive solution and transportation electrification. And so we're really excited about not only the funding, but the authorities to, um, to deploy this on behalf of the American people. Um, and um, not, not qu quite sure what, what Michael covered, but obviously the Department of Energy, um, Department of Transportation uh, Joint Program Office is, is going to um, be helpful in deploying technical assistance, particularly to disadvantaged, low-income, and, and, and other sort of municipalities and localities 
um, who haven't had the experience of deploying um, uh, deploying EV infrastructure. Um, and for that matter, there's a lot of state departments of transportation also that uh, we would envision uh, leveraging the technical assistance and resources provided by the JPO um, in an effort to, to scale, but also to be as strategic as possible. Um, so we're going to be working very closely with the Department of Energy. We're also going to be working very closely with you all. Um, uh, we're going to be looking, you know, to get as diverse um, of a set of perspectives as possible to inform, you know, our guidance and all of the different um, NOFOs and, and tools and standards that, that we're going to need to to deploy. Uh, but we're also going to be looking for a diverse portfolio of uh, project sponsors as well. And a lot of these are going to be set up as public-private partnerships. And so we're hopeful that, that we can work with you all and, and others and, and we can have a partnership in furtherance of you know, our, our mutual interest, which is to deploy charging infrastructure um, that's undergirded by environmental justice and, and also is, is reflective of sort of uh, 21st century infrastructure that's, that's resilient, convenient, accessible, and, and reliable to all. Um, so uh, th thank you so much, Kathy, again, my, my deepest apologies. Andrew, we're so happy that you were able to, to call in and join us. I just one or two uh, quick questions before we wrap up that I'd love to hear your perspective on that I know are of interest to a lot of states. So one is around um, Buy America requirements on chargers and how DOT is thinking about working with uh, the states and providing guidance on that. So we're working very closely with, um, um, you know, with, with the White House, um, really a whole of government strategy to be able to solve for a number of issues, including, including on, on Buy America. Um, you know, we, we have specific congressional direction and statute with respect to how to proceed on Buy America. So I know that our folks are looking carefully at that. And let's just be really candid. You, you know, Buy America is going to be one of the issues that we're going to we're going to have to resolve going forward. We hear from the electrification community that Buy America, um, you know, needs to be resolved to actually get EV charging infrastructure in the ground. And we obviously hear from um, uh, not only our EV friends, but our labor friends as well, um, that while EV charging infrastructure goes uh, goes into the ground, we, we, we need to make sure, you know, to the greatest extent possible that um, that that Buy America and, and other labor um, provisions are, are complied with and adhered to and and, and that's, you know, that's the that's the president's uh, direction as well. So we're going to have to have a, a variety of conversations. We're going to have to do so in, in short order. Um, the good news is, is we we started that process, but but these um, are conversations that are ongoing and are going to need some time to to suss out. So um, so I don't have to do any announcements today, but um, but I, I can assure you that that we're looking at that issue. We know it's a priority, um, and uh, and we'll uh, you know we'll uh, look at it going forward. Thank you. And then one final question: Given the the statutory language around sort of investment in corridors and investment in community charging, any yeah. of yeah. the states on how best to think about leveraging federal funds for community charging? So, I mean, the the intent of um, both of those provisions, both the corridor and community, just to kind of take a step back, the corridor charging program was really intended um, in in some large part to solve for range anxiety. Um, you know, and some of that's psychosomatic, but some of it's it's real it, it, as well, right? P people want an assurance um, that charging infrastructure is going to be available, even if the vast majority of transportation trips are, you know, within um, sort of a confined or, or defined space. Um, you know, folks, folks want the freedom to, to travel and, and just having, um, you know, th that ability to be able to travel, even if it's not very often. Um, that's what we're trying to solve for as part of the corridor piece. With respect to the, the community 
grants that's intended to ensure that we have you know nationwide coverage including in communities um, particularly urban cores and also rural areas um, you know part of the the president's agenda with respect to Justice 40, environmental justice, is to make sure that this charging infrastructure gets in areas that have been disproportionately impacted by transportation investments. So, um, you know, so we want to ensure, just like per your question, we want to ensure that these investments are getting to areas that they need to get to. But we also, you know, want to ensure that, that there is a sufficient amount of um, of need in those areas too. So I think, you know, just adhering first and foremost to, um, to the statutory construct and all of the considerations um, that are part of that statutory construct, right? Like w we want to make sure that the charging infrastructure is accessible. We want to make sure that the, that the charging infrastructure is reliable, that it gets to as many people as possible. Um, and then I, I think, you know, with Michael's leadership and, the leadership of folks from the Department of Transportation and really throughout the federal government will put some finer um, detail via guidance, um, hopefully in, in the weeks and months to come, and folks will have a very clear understanding of, of sort of what, what our expectations are. Great. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. And thanks to all of our panelists, to um, Michael, Andrew, and Ale, and I say, I think I can speak for all of the states that we are really looking forward to working in partnership with you uh, going forward on all of the exciting federal programs that are moving forward and that hopefully will be moving forward under the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Thank turn. you. Will. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much again to Will and to Michael and to Ali and to Andrew for joining us. We will now transition to our next panel, our discussion.